the resource group at Namely. And this is the first time we've had the opportunity to open up our event to our extended Namely family. So thank you for being here tonight in New York, as well as our sister events that are simulcasting in San Francisco and Atlanta, and our guests joining via webinar. So the mission of Women In is to cultivate a community of women and advocates uh, to provide resources to the women of Namely for professional and personal development and to educate others on the issues affecting women. And we got some feedback asking, why is there a man speaking at the speaker mind event? I know y'all did it. So we host and welcome a diverse group of speakers at Speaker Mind. And while the vast majority of our speakers have been women, men are key stakeholders too. And we believe that we have a really great opportunity to welcome every voice in our conversation because we need every stakeholder to be involved in our movement. So tonight, our speakers our Namely CEO, Elisa Steele, will be speaking with our featured guest, who's a New York Times bestseller, an award and professor, and an industry thought leader, Adam Grant. So please join Women In and my colleagues and I in welcoming Adam and Elisa. Bring it up. Hi, everyone. I'll do a quick mic check if everybody can hear me and welcome to everyone on the web webcast across our Namely offices as well as our remote offices and other guests. I'm so psyched to be here with Adam and Michelle kicked us off just right. Why the heck are you here, Adam, to talk about gender bias? Well, I, do you know anything about this subject? Elisa, I thought you were going to answer that question because you, you invited me. No, look, I think the, the standard answer from from men to that question is because I'm a father of daughters, right? I have two daughters. And I think that answer is embarrassing. Uh, how about I'm here because I'm a human being yeah. and I care about people and women are people. Well, how true that is. And I think I'll speak for some of us women um, that it is kind of a bummer when men say, hey, I'm here because I have a daughter or I'm here because I want to, you know, stand up for my wife. It's like, how about we're here because we're all, like you said, human beings, and we want the world to get the talent and the input from everybody that, that's willing to give it. So anyways, welcome, Adam. We're so happy to have you. Thank you. And that remains to be seen, doesn't it? Well, we will, we will see. We will see. Um, we'll let the audience be the judge, actually. Um, so I'm going to actually start off with a question around Namely, because we have a mission to build better workplaces. We build software and we create experiences for our customers, but really our purpose is bigger than that. And what I wanted to know from you is what is some of the things that you are doing in your role as a Wharton professor that kind of bring to light how do you build better workplaces and what's some of the new research that maybe the audience hasn't read about that you can tease us with that's coming out? Yeah. Um, well, look, full disclosure, I just study how to make work better. I don't actually do it, right? <laughs> so uh, you should take anything I say with a grain of salt. But uh, we actually, uh, we just got news earlier today that a new experiment we ran in a big professional services firm has been accepted for publication, uh, which is the kind of thing that's supposed to excite you if you're an academic. But uh, the reason that, that I think this is really cool is uh, it was on unconscious bias training. And pretty much every company I know now does some form of bias training. And every time I go into an organization that does it, my first question is, how do you know that it actually works? And the most common answer is, we don't. We just assume it's necessary and we want to make sure that nobody can point a finger at us as not caring. And so we got this firm to agree to actually test the effects of training. We designed our, our own training based on theirs and based on a lot of evidence. On, uh, on how to get people to be more aware of bias. And uh, we found in the, in the experiment that bias training only changes the behavior of people who are already on board uh, with promoting diversity, which was primarily in the study women who work in the US. Uh, if you are a man in the US or you are a woman from one of about 35 other countries in the study, we were able to move the needle on your attitudes and get you to think a little bit about gender equality as an important issue but your behavior did not change at all in terms of mentoring women, advocating for women, trying to get women promoted, 
And I've, I've started to realize at some point that what this research suggests is that this is a multi-phase process, right? You can't just do one training and assume that all of a sudden people who are really sexist or not open to gender equality are suddenly going to transform. Uh, what you have to do is, is begin to nudge their attitudes and get them to think about all the barriers and the biases that women face. And then over time, as those attitudes move, they're much more likely then to be willing to act on the next training that they go through. So what is the catalyst to act if it's not the next training? What could we do in what we call kind of micro actions to mm -hmm. sort of get that catalyst to happen faster? So this is something I've been trying to tackle in the classroom for almost a decade now. Uh, I've seen year after year that our, um, our, among our MBA students at Wharton, women on average are better leaders than men. Uh, if you look at the effectiveness of the teams that they lead and also the ratings that they get. Uh, but in self ratings, men actually believe that they're better leaders. Uh, and not surprisingly, that leads more men to end up in leadership positions, fewer women to apply, and also fewer women to get selected by both men and women. And so we, we were trying to figure out how to tackle that. And one of the simple things that I found is really effective is just to, to begin highlighting the gap. But then instead of trying to convince people that the gap is driven by bias, I actually turn it over to the audience. And so I'll say, look, here is the disparity in leadership between men and women. Uh, what do you think is driving that? And then somebody will say, well, you know, there's a, there's a difference in skill. And I'll say, actually, here's what our skill data show. If anything, that should, that should mean women are overrepresented in leadership. So that doesn't really fly. What, yeah. what else do you think could be going on? And eventually you debunk all the other explanations and they say, gosh, it must be the case that some women are self-limiting and then many women and men are for some reason biased against women leaders. And then they get curious and they start to wonder, well, why would that be? And then you can actually start to open their minds. Yeah. You know, speaking of bias, and I'm not sure if this is a bias or not, but I'd love your opinion on it, is we did a study with our Namely customers, anonymized data. We have a recognition portion of our product, which you know, and I can give you kudos any day of the week and say, hey, thanks, Adam. You've never done that, out. by the way. <laughs> we'll get on Namely and we'll do maybe, that together. Maybe after today. <laughs> um, <laughs> and what we found was that men and women in our product, on our platform, across all of our customers get recognized pretty evenly. 50% of the time it's men, 50% of the time it's women. Yeah. And the men who got recognized also got recognized kind of half the time by men, half the time by women. So it was pretty even. Yeah. The women who were recognized got recognized by women 65% of the time and men the rest. Why the disparity? Are you trying to get me to mansplain here? <laughs> Cause I'm not taking the bait. Right on the spot. Uh, why is that? Uh, I think there are a couple of possible explanations. Uh, I think probably the, it reminds me a little bit of uh, what women in the Obama administration did when they noticed that their ideas were not getting heard. So at least I'm sure you've been through this before in your career, right? A woman speaks up with an idea and nobody really takes it seriously. And then a few minutes later, a man jumps in and everybody thinks it's brilliant. And has when, that ever happened yeah. to you? Anyone? <laughs> so uh, in the administration, what happened was... By the way, thank you, men, for coming. We, we do love you, and we're actually going to talk about you, too, yeah. in a little bit. We're so happy to have you supporting us. Yeah, I'm sure none of the men in the room are the problem, right? Um, no, I think that, in, in all seriousness, what, what happened in the Obama, Obama administration is a bunch of women said, we have to amplify each other's ideas to make sure they get heard. And so if that happened, um, at least if your idea got overlooked, another woman might jump in and say, hey, actually, Elisa had that idea. And I think it's such an important suggestion. And so I wonder if that's what's going on here, that women are aware that, that women are systematically overlooked mm -hmm. when they speak up with ideas and suggestions, when they contribute. And so they're, they're trying to compensate for that. Do you think that's what's happening? Well, it could be. I mean, I, I, we found it so interesting. We've been talking to our, our customers about it as well. But there's something that it doesn't recognize, which is I think some of the women in the room will relate to this. I know I do. When you're the only woman in the room, Who's going to advocate and say, hey, I thought that was so-and-so's idea. So we need awareness of this across both men and women because it, it's happening. I do think the, the evidence is pretty strong that when women's are, women are tokens, that problem gets a lot worse. Um, but even when you have pretty good gender parity, you start to see these kinds of problems. So uh, I see this dynamic in research that some colleagues and I have done on helping, where when, uh, when women are generous, it gets taken for granted. Because, you know, stereotypically, women are caring and communal. They want to help. Whereas when a man helps, it's like, huh, men are supposed to be ambitious and results-oriented. 
and I never would have expected him to care about another human. Now I have to shower him with praise and rewards. <laughs> And so this, this creates this, this really unfair- Thank you so much for yeah. coming, Adam. I oh, really I'm, appreciate it. I know, I was totally, it was not expected of me, but um, women are sort of damned if they do if, and damned if they don't. Whereas men are allowed to say no and they're credited uh, when they do say yes. Um, and I think that's a big part of the problem. We, it's, to me, it's shocking that in the 21st century, we are still evaluating people based on their gender as opposed to their contribution. So, so it brings up, um another kind of interesting point, which I think you wrote about, but we also had a conversation at Namely where our women in group, um, and, and people outside our women in group brought up inside the company, which is, is it true and do we feel like women are doing more of the administrative kind of, what you would categorize as household or housework tasks in the workplace? Now, sometimes it's a part of your job because you're, because you're in that type of a role. Sometimes you're doing it because you are, a yeah. kind, helping other type of person, or you're just like doing it because you're a human being. But why is it and what can we do to sort of make people aware that that's happening in the workplace? Because even if it's not intentional, yeah. it doesn't feel good. Well, so Rosabeth Moss Cantor coined this term back in the 70s. And she said, look, just like women get stuck with the majority of the housework at home, they also do the majority of the office housework, the taking notes in meetings, the organizing events, uh, all of the kind of extra support stuff that it needs to get done, but then it doesn't really count. It's not valued. And we kind of just assumed for the next 40 years that, that this was true. And uh, just this last year, um, Linda Babcock led a series of experiments. She's an economist looking at, is there really a gender disparity in office housework? Mm. And what the data showed was that women were 44% more likely to be asked to do thankless tasks in gender even groups. And then they also felt more pressure to say yes. Uh, and then got penalized if they said no. And so, yeah, I think this is real. Uh, I think that probably most of the people in the room can attest to it. And I think the first thing we have to do is raise awareness about it. But the second thing we need to do is to change the way we allocate these, excuse me, allocate these tasks, right? There's no reason why uh, any particular individual should be asked to do office housework, right? We should either have a rotating system where it's just spread across the whole office, or we should have a set of jobs where that's part of the job description. Um, but ultimately, I think, I think we need men to step up right, and say, look, I am willing to carry my, carry my share of this burden, even though it's not visible, it's not always rewarded. Uh, we need to make sure that it doesn't get unfairly dumped on women. Yeah, I think, I think that's true. I think um, there is more awareness on it, but we still see the behavior. I want to go back to the comment you made about your daughters, because we kind of joked about it and said, hey, I, wanted, I, I don't want to say that I'm kind of embarrassed. But the truth is, I believe your truth is, that you wished you had become more of an advocate for women before you had your daughters. Thanks for reminding so me. So it would be <laughs> super interesting to this audience of how that change happened for you personally. Yeah, um, you know, it's interesting. I don't, uh, this is really tricky for me as a social scientist because uh, there are a bunch of confounding events that happened at the same time and I don't know which ones really mattered the most. Uh, so our first daughter was born in 2008 and then our second in 2011. And I started to become much more passionate about gender equality. I became much more outspoken uh, about feminism around that time. I also, though, around that time, was seeing a lot of our extraordinary female MBA students get passed over for leadership roles um, and you know, get overlooked. And I actually had a couple of my colleagues. Uh, so I, I teach this, um, this core teamwork and leadership class for the MBAs in August. It's the first class you take in, uh, in the Wharton program. And there are four of us who teach it. We each get a quarter of the students and two of us are male and two are female. And my two female colleagues said, we need to, you know, we see this gender disparity. We need to talk about it in the classroom. And I said, well, I don't feel comfortable because, you know, I've never been a woman. Uh, I can't, you know, I can't personally relate to these issues. It's not my place. And they went and did it and I didn't. And they got a ton of backlash for it. Uh, there were male wow. students in particular who said, this is self-serving. Our female professors are trying to advocate for their own group and right. demonize us. This is not right. And I started to wonder if I'd gotten this backward. And it's actually easier for men to talk about these issues. And so the next year I said, okay, I'm, you know, I'm not going to be a coward anymore. I'm going to raise these issues. And um, I got applauded for it. And it wasn't until a few years later that David Heckman led this research showing that when, uh, when women and minorities advocate for diversity, uh, they face a slight penalty because it is seen as self-serving yeah, or nepotistic. Yeah. 
Whereas when, uh, when men do it, again, they get a nice pat on the back. Oh, what a good guy, right? He cares about other groups. And so I think this is a barrier that holds a lot of people back. There's a, a series of studies that uh, Subra Ten, excuse me, Tangarala just led, which showed that when, um, when men confront gender equality issues, they often stay silent because they lack what's called the psychological standing to speak up, which is, I, as soon as I saw that term, I was like, oh, that's exactly what I felt. This is not my place. Yeah. And yet, if men don't speak up, then we only have women advocating for these issues and taking a risk in doing that. So let's take that a little bit further because um, our employee resource groups inside of Namely and many of our customers are to have an affinity with all sorts of diversity attributes of people. So does that theory apply if you talk about race or yep. um, sexual orientation or uh, any other background that would make you feel like you had a diverse characteristic? Yeah, it does. So um, generally speaking, uh, when people speak out on behalf of their own group, uh, they face a little bit of backlash for that. Mm -hmm. And so it's oftentimes the, the dominant group that you want to have advocate. Um, and the nice part of that is not only are they not biased, but they also tend to have more status, right? And so it's, it's easier for them to, to get away with raising the issue, so to speak. I think, it's, um, I think it's really tricky, though, in the sense that oftentimes you put your foot in your mouth when you speak up about these issues, right? I know the, the first time that I ever sp spoke up about gender equality, uh, I was accused of essentializing gender differences and saying that there are fundamental you know, biological differences between men and women. Uh, which is the exact opposite of what I think most of the data would suggest on most dimensions. Uh, but I'd never spoken about it before. I wasn't really comfortable with the language. And so immediately I got this feedback saying, oh, maybe I was right all along. I should never have stuck my hand in that fan. And I think we need to be a little bit more tolerant when a majority group speaks on behalf of a minority group, knowing that, hey, they're trying. They may not always get it right, but I'd rather have them speak up than stay silent. And we've seen more, of, I think, we've seen more of that in society lately, of, and it makes you nervous. It's um, maybe very similar to what we might talk about is happening with the Me Too movement, right? Because it becomes like, if I say the wrong thing, but my intentions are good. So what would your advice be for people who feel that way, but do want to contribute to a better, better situation? What kinds of people are we talking about? Any kinds of people. I mean, it could be men, women, it could be race, it could be. Um, I'm probably not a good person to give advice on this, generally speaking. I don't think we have good empirical evidence about how to navigate this yet. And I feel like my responsibility as an organizational psychologist is to ask, what do the data show? Yeah. And then try to give recommendations that are evidence-based. I don't think we're there yet. I do think um, the, the most disturbing data I've seen so far was the Lean-In survey last year. Uh, which showed that uh, there was a significant increase, I think a tripling in the number of male managers who were afraid to have one-on-ones with, uh, with their female subordinates. And I think that's a huge problem, right? Because think about all the valuable advice and mentoring that happens in those one-on-one -on -one meetings. And I think the response from you know, a lot of managers, I've actually talked with, with senior executives who have, who have gone through this. They've said, you know what? I don't like it, but I'm gonna have to adopt the Mike Pence rule. And I won't have one-on-ones uh, with a woman. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sheryl Sandberg came and, and said, well, actually that's, that's okay as long as then you don't have dinner with a man one-on-one -on -one either, right? Because otherwise you're disadvantaging women. And I thought that was such a powerful point. And I think that's probably the best advice I've seen so far is to say, look, you've got to evaluate your own practices and say, if there are things that you do, if there are doors that you open for men, but not for women, uh, then you're perpetuating the inequalities that exist in the system. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, let's go back to talk a little bit about um, gender equality in the workplace specifically. And if there's any research that kind of gives us an understanding better about how behaviors can reflect the, the ability to create more equality, behaviors from men or behaviors from women. Because although women and we've been talking about the inequality, women could be doing things too to bring the issues more to light to enable the behavior. Sure. Um, so Lisa, let me, um, let me put you on the spot here and say, look, you're a CEO. Uh, you're trying to navigate these issues. What behavioral changes have made the biggest difference for you as a leader or for the teams that you work with? Well, I think, I think you know that when we were talking earlier, I kind of felt like, okay, well, when you're the only woman in the room, what do you do? And we sort of touched on that a few minutes ago. And I think sometimes you just have to kind of stand up and say, hey, wait a second, what just happened, right? You don't have to be 
negative or accusatory or yeah. necessarily you might be upset. But I think bringing light to it and yeah. sometimes with a little bit of humor or smile kind of makes people go, okay, like I can engage in this. What, what did just happen there? Mm -hmm. and, and kind of make it okay or make it better. And I think many of us have experienced that. Yeah, I like that a lot. It reminds me, I've, I've dreamed for a couple of years now of uh, taking these sociometric badges that were built at the MIT Media Lab. So you can wear it's like a You'll giant. You'll have to explain that <laughs> yeah. to the audience, please. Uh, so there, it's, it's a giant necklace that you wear and it has, um, it has a bunch of digital sensors in it. And what it'll display on the screen then in front of you is the total talk time that each person has commanded. And so you can see like, wow, men have talked 92% of this meeting. Uh, and it's these two guys who are dominating the conversation. And it just seems like such a simple intervention to get people to be aware of, you know, of how much they're not creating space for other people's voices. And um, I, I guess I had the organic version of that happen to me. It was about actually around the same time that, uh, that I had, that we had our first daughter. Uh, I had a professor, um, a woman in my department come to watch me teach my class. And I was teaching a session on a topic she'd never taught before. She was going to cover it in a, in a different class a few weeks later. So she just came by to, to see what she could learn. And afterward, I asked for feedback. And I said, hey, what's, what's the one thing that I could do better that you think is the top priority? And then, you know, what are all the other things to work on? She said, well, I noticed the first eight people you called on were men. Mm. And I got extremely defensive. And I said, well, you know, the first eight hands were up were men. And you know, if I, I feel like my job is to, if some people are engaging, my job is to, to call on them and re, yeah, reinforce that, right? And she said, no, your job is to create a classroom where everybody feels comfortable jumping in right away. And if they don't, to figure out what's a better mechanism than for getting people to speak up. And I did not take that well at all. Uh, it took me about a month before I came around and said, you know what, why is this happening? Uh, what have I done to create a classroom environment where Either I've just allowed that norm to passively emerge, or I haven't gone out of my way to try to open the door for women to speak up. And I think that was such an effective intervention, even though it was pretty painful for me to go through. Yeah. And I think that more women and men could probably have that conversation. And it, w it wasn't the fun, lighthearted version of what you're talking about, but it definitely worked. You no, know, it can get hard. I mean, not, not here at Namely, but I had someone working for me in one of my previous jobs who was a big talker. And smart, big talker, but I started having an issue with staff meetings on how do I actually make sure that I'm running it. <laughs> and uh, I had to have a pretty serious conversation, but what we wound up doing, which was super simple, is I said, look, um, for whatever reason, you're not hearing me. So I need you to see me. So when I stand up, that's a good indicator to you. <laughs> be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And it physically worked because we dealt with that privately. But then in the open, when I stood up in staff and started walking, he knew. And so he could adjust his behavior. So it was a way that we could sort of figure out how to deal with it without creating a big issue openly. Can we just pause and applaud? That was badass. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're getting me to tell stories. I'm supposed to be interviewing you. How do you do that? That's very skillful. <laughs> um, so, so you also have, have said this, you've said, hey, um, men should listen like they're wrong. I don't, I don't even know if someone told me, listen like you're wrong, I don't know what I would do. So how do you explain that to us? How, do, how should men take that comment and sort of put it into action that would help this whole issue? I think, so this is a phrase I borrowed from Carl Weick, who said, in the most creative organizations, people consistently argue like they're right, but they listen like they're wrong. Mm. And I think most of us, especially men, are good at the first and not so good at the second. So what does it mean to listen like you're wrong? I think it means uh, approaching a conversation as if uh, you're, um, you're new to the topic or you don't have any expertise, or you're not really sure of your opinions. And I, I actually think about this a lot with, uh, with our five-year-old son, uh, who you know, almost on a daily basis will come, like he asked the other day, why, um, what keeps our bones together? I was like, I don't know. <laughs> I was like, I'm not sure, actually. Uh, by, by the way, I'm a psychologist, not, like, this is, I, not a clue. Uh, they, I think they just stick. Um, <laughs> But, they keep asking those questions, by the way, until they're about 10, so. <laughs> all right, so we've got, we've got more, more to work with there. Um, but that's actually the mindset that I want to be in, right? Yeah. 
right? So when um, when it, when that professor confronted me and said, "Hey, you know, you're not calling on you know on any women. Why not?" Um, my first approach should be to say, "Like, huh? I have no idea. I wonder. I wonder why that is. I've never noticed that pattern before." And then you know, kind of treat it as if I'm I'm an alien coming into this environment for the first time. Yeah, I, I think what you're really saying is show curiosity. Yeah, that's so, a better way to say it. So instead of kind of, oh, well, this is why, kind of step back and ask a few questions because everyone else's view is always something you're going to learn from. So once you hear that view, you can sort of say, oh, wow, I could see how that could be perceived. I think in the workplace that happens every day, not even just because of gender, but you take a judgment away, yeah. don't ask enough questions and then walk away with probably an incorrect point of view, yeah. which sort of gets all the teams on the wrong page or at least on different pages. It does. One of my, one of my favorite experiments on this uh, was uh, an experiment where people were given negative feedback uh, and often told that they were biased or they were discriminating or they were showing some kind of prejudice. And it turned out that if you just preface that feedback with 19 words, then the, people were roughly 40% more receptive Okay. to being criticized. Okay, tell us. So this might be 18 or 20, but the, the gist was uh, you're supposed to say, I'm giving you these comments because I, I have very high expectations of you and I'm confident you can reach them. And it completely changes the tone of the conversation. Right? Well, because you just told me you believe in me. Yeah, huh? I'm not judging you. I'm not attacking you. I actually believe you can improve. So I want to give you this helpful feedback, right? And so I, I started teaching this in the classroom. And a couple of weeks later, I give out my mid-course feedback forms. And three different students have written at the top, I'm giving you these comments because I have very high ex <laughs> I'm like, you could have at least coordinated to change the language a little bit. So Show a little originality. Yeah, it felt a little bit canned, but I, I, I thought it was hilarious. And um, I think that so often we forget to put the feedback we're giving people in context, right? And say, look, look um, we, we worry a lot about wordsmithing. Uh, we're constantly afraid that if we say something the wrong way, we're going to offend someone. And I think the reality is that in the context of a relationship that has trust and support, um, you can say things pretty bluntly and people will take it. Uh, and I don't think we spend enough time trying to figure out how do I create a relationship where this person will be open to whatever I have to say. Yeah, yeah. I think that's really, really good advice. And actually it extends to uh, management as well. So you reminded me when you were talking about women and men in performance, um, at least I would say earlier in my career when I was a younger manager and I had both men and women reporting to me, which I think earlier in my career, I definitely noticed more, especially if the men were older than me. It's like, oh, okay, there's something like different here. And what do you do to have that conversation? And there was my first couple of years of management, the learning of definite confidence in a performance review of this is what I did, here's why it's good, yeah. what's my raise? And I remember, um, uh, I remember a specific uh, woman who was working for me who um, was absolutely the top performer in the group and, and she just didn't know it or have the confidence to know it and I'm trying to tell her in her performance review um, and she just had so much of that kind of bias that we talked about or just even self um, awareness of what was going on in the group um, that she actually told me, you know, I, I, I think that I don't think I deserve that raise. Like that's, that, that, that's so surprising to me. I don't, that's not the amount that I expected. And it's like, well, wow, no, you do deserve it and you should take it and you should feel really, yeah. really proud of that. So I think in giving feedback as well, you're going to have that difference in, in, in gender and you're going to want to pull out so that they can talk, people can talk openly about, yeah, I actually got that done and I'm proud of it. I, uh, I would just underscore that in roughly 40 years of attribution research on how people explain their successes and failures. There's a pretty robust pattern that men tend to take credit for success and blame failure on others. And women are a little bit more likely to do the opposite. And so I think often we have to overcorrect in those situations. So let's talk about kind of the opposite of that for a minute, which is in, in my view, that their men traditionally in business have had, of course, the power, the title, and the money. So that's kind of led to all of our quality issues or a part of all of our quality issues. But they're also can be our biggest advocates and biggest levers for change. You're trying to praise and men right now? Is that what's happening here? Trying to give them give him a give him, give him motivation and credit, right? So this is very true that I would say for, with my career, there's been many men. I wouldn't 
be able to accomplish what I've accomplished unless I've had some amazing mentors. And most of them, many of them were men. And that makes a big difference. And there can be a lot of um, just the, a bigger lever because there's more men in those positions than there are women. So it doesn't mean we don't want the women to group together and to help each other yeah. and to call out those behaviors, but we definitely need the men. For sure. I agree with that. I think though, I'm, I'm very ambivalent about whether we should just be going around applauding men who are good at supporting women, right? I think doing the right thing should be its own reward. And I think the more that we go out of our way to, you know, to create bonuses or awards or you know, celebrate men who are great champions of women, we're actually putting the, we're shining the spotlight in the wrong place. And uh, I worry about that sometimes. Yeah, I think, that's, I think that's a good thing to worry about because we don't want to create a bar um, that doesn't get met by everybody, right? Basically, you don't want to lower the bar, you want to raise the bar. Yeah. But I, I think um, the action orientation of how to make change has to happen with both men and women. And men right now have a bigger lever. So it's not about giving them recognition or praise, it's about turning them into an advocate that they want to do that every day. I am on board. I think, uh, I think one mistake that a lot of people make is, I'm just curious actually, let's pull the audience for those of you who are here live in New York. Um, when it comes to making the case for gender, equal gender equality or any kind of diversity, uh, which are you more likely to do? To make the business case and talk about why it's the smart thing to do or to make the moral case and talk about why it's the right thing to do? Let's get a show of hands. So how many people are more inclined to do the business case and say, this is smart, this makes our company more successful? Okay, and then how many people prefer the moral case? This is the right thing to do. We've got a majority for the business case. Uh, Elisa, why do you go for the moral case? Why are you in the minority here? Um, and I run a business. Um, I'm in the, I guess, I don't know why I'm in the minority, but I guess I feel that way because I feel like we do our work for purpose. And if you're connected to a purpose you believe in, you're gonna get a great business outcome. And so I always go for that first and try to drive that alignment. Love that. So there's, this is obviously a big area of debate. And there's finally a set of studies to try to resolve it. So Sue Ashford and Dave Mayer just published this research where they, they actually pitted the two against each other. And they both looked at, at people who tried each strategy. And then they also ran experiments where they randomly assigned people to either make one case or the other. And they found overwhelmingly consistent evidence that the business case doesn't work. That when you tell people diversity makes us smarter, it makes us more successful, Managers in particular and companies are not any more likely to adopt diversity issues. Mm -hmm. They're not more likely to spend time on them. They're not more likely to invest money in them. And I think the main reason for that is even if people buy the business case, there are lots of other business cases that are being made at the same time. And so whatever investment I'm going to make in diversity, I can probably find a higher ROI in something else, right? Whereas the moral case, there is no alternative logic to go in a different direction, right? When you say this is the right thing to do, People can't say, well, I'm gonna go do some other right thing instead, right? right? Like, right. well, if I don't do the right thing, I'm doing the wrong thing here. Right. Right. And so um, there's a caveat for that though, which is the moral case only works if it's highlighted as aligned with mission and values within the company. And so to your point about purpose, if you're gonna make the moral case, you have to say, look, given who we are as a company, given our core principles and values, here's why this is a moral move. This is an ethical consideration to, you know, to cover um, either, underrepresented groups to make sure that people who are getting overlooked get promoted, right? Fill in the blank. Um, and I think we've been doing this wrong. I've been told for over a decade that you've got to make the business case. Stop it. Make the moral case. Do you think that the moral case, it, that's super interesting um, and connected to purpose. Do you think the moral case is more prevalent in businesses today based on the next generation of workforce or how would you describe that mm. if you would connect it? Because we talk a lot about, yeah. you know, um, the diversity of age in yep. companies as well, the millennial workforce and how do you, it, and the changes that have happened over the years. Is there a connection? I don't think so. So I think we talk a lot about how millennials are more into purpose than baby boomers or Gen Xers. Uh, I know of no evidence that's true. In fact, if anything, I believe the opposite is true empirically. Uh, that if you look at, uh, we, I got some data uh, from Facebook uh, with the Facebook people analytics team, where we looked at uh, all the different motivations that people brought to their jobs as a Facebook employee. And we found that younger employees were actually most concerned about career. And that was the biggest driver of their engagement is to say, look, am I learning? Am I getting challenged? Am I gaining new skills? 
and that the more senior you were, um, both in experience and in age, the more you were concerned about, uh, about trying to work for a cause and feel like your job or the company made the world a better place in some way. And that tracks a lot with the, the general data on people's concern for meaning and purpose and also generosity, which is there tends to be a spike uh, which, which occurs right around midlife or mid-career. And I think there are a few explanations for that. One is people feel like they have more to contribute, right? And you can probably relate to this as, as your career evolves, you have more knowledge, you have more skills, you have more connections. And so you feel like it's easier to advance a purpose. Uh, you also feel like you have less to lose, right? Because you've kind of made it. Yeah. And then you also start to get really worried about these 22 year old people that are coming into your organization. And you know, if somebody doesn't create a purpose to, to help them, we're all screwed. Um, all, all joking aside though, I think that uh, we should stop labeling purpose as a millennial trend. The millennials who care about it probably are more vocal about it, but there aren't more of them. Uh, I think that purpose is a fundamental human motivation. Since the early 1970s, when you ask people what they want most in a job, meaning has swamped everything else. And that's been true for every generation. Well, isn't it funny? It just comes down to your first comment, which is we're all human beings. And we all want to contribute to a bigger purpose and we want to have meaning in our job. But I wonder, based on what you said, if it's really connected to financial independence as well. Because yeah. earlier in your career, and you said, focus, focus, focus on career ladder. Yeah. Is that really focusing on, I want to have financial independence so that I know yeah. that I'm okay? It might be. I, I really love this work that Haley Brewer has done though at IDEO, where she shows that increasingly people are not trying to maximize their net worth. They're trying to maximize their net freedom. Uh -huh. And I think that's a great phrase because when you think about what net freedom is to people, sometimes that means, you know what, I want to make sure that my work doesn't take over my life. But in other cases, it means I want to take a job that's going to maximize the number of options that I have available if I decide I want to pivot or change gears. Uh, and I do think that probably has increased. Yeah. Um, Adam, you spoke at HR Redefined, our user conference last I year. I did. It was a blast. And you were able to connect with some of our customers, and you've learned a little bit, obviously, about Namely's pur purpose as one of our advisors. Um, can you share what takeaways you had from the user conference itself and any advice you have for Namely? How candid do you want me to be? Only as candid as the webcast, and make the webcast good. <laughs> <laughs> no, very candid. <laughs> no, I was, uh, so I was, I was struck by two things at HR Redefined. I think the first one was, um, people are really passionate about the product. I didn't expect that, right? HR tech is usually pretty boring. And I know the, I'm not gonna name the, the particular HR software that my fine institution uses, uh, but suffice it to say, it is the bane of my existence. And we can help you with that, by the way. Sometimes I don't even Stay get, after class. I, <laughs> sometimes I don't even get paid because I hate logging into this. Anyway, it's a whole nother conversation. But uh, I think I, I heard over and over again, especially from people who are running small and medium sized businesses, that it was so helpful for them and just in terms of, you know, attracting and retaining people, but especially for just helping people know where they stood. Right, and having a very clean, simple dashboard. And I've rarely heard people talk with enthusiasm uh, about you know, a platform like Namely. So uh, I thought that was really cool. And then the other thing was, I've spoken to some HR conferences where there are a bunch of stodgy benefits police sort of in the, in the audience. Not and in this audience. No, this was, I mean, the, the, the conference was very much like this audience, right? It was people who were forward thinking, who were young, who were excited about driving innovation and who really believe that people are not costs to be managed or cut, um, that, they're, that people are remarkably talented and that if we can invest in people, then we can make organizations better. Um, I came away from that conference thinking, like I hear leaders say sometimes, oh, well, you know, people are the most important asset in your company. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, this is a group of people who thinks that is a ridiculous statement because last time I checked, people are your company. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what the majority of your expenses are in a company is, employing your people. So what's your point of view on the change in the marketplace on the importance of people? Why has it come to light now that everyone's enlightened that, wow, like we should be focused on our people and our people are our biggest assets? Or as our chief people officer says, every people decision you make is a business decision. Yeah. So I, I think we need to put this more in historical context. So Jim Walsh and his colleagues have studied why sort of people become more and also less important in businesses over time. 
And it almost looks like a pendulum shift if you track it since the 1930s. So the human relations movement in business actually started in the 30s, right? There, there was, I think a lot of you will have read about it at some point, the Hawthorne experiments, where you, know, you go into these plants and uh, managers have these, these bright ideas and they say, well, what if we actually asked our employees what they wanted? And they did it and employees said, well, we're working in really dark, you know, dark spaces. It would be great to have more light. And they bring this illumination and all of a sudden productivity goes up. And then they're like, wait, I wonder what else it might be. Maybe we should give them water too. Yeah, that would be helpful. <laughs> um, and you know, the, the, the lesson of, of those experiments, which uh, needs more research behind it, was the specific changes didn't matter as much as actually knowing that your manager cared about you. And that seemed to happen right around the time of the Great Depression when you know, people were really struggling. And you realize what a difference it could make to motivate people. Right? And to create a job that was meaningful, that was enjoyable, uh, to where people felt valued and appreciated. And then over time, as the economy improved, uh, you can slack off a little bit on that and still do pretty well. And I think that um, that can go in either direction. And so I think the, the recent shift is actually driven by the opposite. I think talent has a ton of power right now. Right? I think that if you are a star employee, you have tons of job options. You could probably find a job on LinkedIn tomorrow. Right? And so it's really hard for companies to, to attract and retain great people. And I think that that means a competitive advantage has to come from being a better place to work. That's exactly right. So what do you um, uh, think about the concept that people leave managers, they don't leave companies? Is that still true today? And how would you, does any of your research, can you share with us, like, why do people leave companies? What is the number one reason? So the turnover research actually says that you're, on average, your, your boss and your job matter about equally mm -hmm. in shaping your decision to leave. I so think, how long do I stay at a company with a crappy boss, even if I love the purpose? Um, I think your, your first responsibility is to speak up and try to get your boss to improve. And then if that doesn't work, try to get a new boss. And if that doesn't work, it's probably time to leave, if you can. Um, I think, though, it's, it's worth recognizing that, that managers have more impact than we realize. Because even if managers are only about as influential as how much you like your work and determining whether you stay, most of the time it's your manager who designed your job. And so the manager has a double impact, right? There's a, okay, what is it like to work with this person? But also how meaningful, how interesting was the work that they created for you? Um, Adam Bryant's here and has written a brilliant article on how Google has built better managers over time. And what I am stunned by in that research is how easy it is to be a good manager. It turns out you're supposed to do things like, Listen up, namely. Yeah, like, ready? Get this. Great <laughs> managers at Google. Easy. <laughs> great managers at Google. Adam can tell you, he's seen the data. They do things like they meet their employees on their first day at work. <laughs> this is rocket science, right? Uh, but a lot of people are busy and they don't think to do that. And so I think it's, it's worth recognizing that there are very small steps we can all take to become slightly better managers. And another thing I've, uh, I've picked up uh, that came from a different article Adam wrote is uh, one of the things great managers often do is they recognize that uh, it's really complex to work with your boss. And there are user manuals for technology, right? Like if, if you bought a new computer or a new car, there's an owner's manual. It tells Look you how to operate it, right? But you don't get a user manual for your boss. And so I love the fact that there are a bunch of leaders now who have said one of the ways I can be a good manager is I can ask the people who have worked with me to write a manual for how to work effectively with me. Well, it's all the stuff you wish you had known about working with me on day one. And then that actually becomes a guide that gets handed over to your new employees. I would encourage everybody in this room to do that. I've, uh, I've done it recently myself. I only predicted about a third of what was on it. And uh, I realized I had a lot to learn and a lot to change. And I think your comments on um, being a manager and making it easy is actually being a human being. How do you create that human connection of, I actually care about what you're working on. I don't want to get in your way to get, have you get your job done, but I care. And I want to ask questions and I want to be involved in having that dialogue with you. And I think people yeah. get so busy that that doesn't happen and you lose that connection and then you feel disconnected when you're not connected. Doesn't that make sense? It does. It does. I think. Uh, <laughs> Let me think of another word. Yeah, no, it, it reminds me of when I was, uh, when I was writing my first book, Give and Take, uh, I kept hearing over and over uh, something I, I, I couldn't find a good study on and I regret not having written about it, which is the, the most common thing I heard from great managers that no other manager said was, uh, I care more about my people's success than the company's success. Mm -hmm. 
And that seemed kind of backward, right? That, that almost sounds like a nepotistic manager. Um, the reality is if you put your people first, right, they end up contributing in ways that are good for the team and the organization. And I think that, you know, at some level, uh, it's the case that to be a great manager is a lot like being um, Dean Smith, the, the longtime UNC basketball coach, who always said to his players, we will do the, what's best for the team during the season, but we do what's best for the player in the offseason. And what that meant is Dean Smith encouraged Michael Jordan to go to the draft after his freshman year. And that seems like a really dumb decision for a college basketball coach to make, right? You want to encourage the best player ever. Sorry, LeBron. But <laughs> you want to encourage the best player ever to stay for as many years as you can, two, three, ideally four. Um, but what Smith found in the long run was that he was able to attract the best talent because he had a reputation for putting players first. And every year his recruiting class benefited from that. And I think managers get that too. If you are constantly saying, look, I not only want to develop my employees, I want to develop you so much that if there's a better opportunity in another company, I'm going to encourage you to go take that. You will get better talent. Those employees that you sent to other companies are also then more likely to boomerang and come back and want to work for you again one day. That's so true. It also creates choice. And when you create a choice yeah. for yourself that I want to stay, that means I'm, I have more ownership of my relationship with you. So it makes a lot of sense. Love so that. one more question, and then we're going to open it up. I know there's questions across the, across the country here. Um, tell us a little bit about how to be a giver. Who's a giver and who's a taker? And how do you, how do, you do that in the workplace? Hmm. Well, let's find out, shall we? Uh, let's take my favorite question to gauge who's a giver and who's a taker. Uh, this has been studied for about 35 years in integrity test research. So we'll consider a taking behavior like theft, stealing from a company. Question is what percent of employees in a typical month steal at least 10 US dollars from their employer? So we'll define theft will include cash, IP, materials, and merchandise. What percent of employees steal at least 10 US dollars a month from their employer? And uh, I'll just ask for those of you who are here live, uh, I'm going to call out some percentages. When you hear the range that you're in, can you just snap your fingers like that? All right, here we go. Zero to 20%. Snap. Okay, 21 to 40. 41 to 60. 61 to 80. 81 to 99. <laughs> Anyone for 100? All right, good, because that would include you. <laughs> so take your results with a grain of salt, but the data do show that the higher your estimate that other people are thieves, the greater the odds that you're a thief. So if you're sitting near someone with an 80, 81 or higher estimate, I would check your wallet right now. <laughs> now look, there, there are lots of, lots of ways you could give a high estimate without being a taker, but the psychology of this is fascinating to me because many of you probably did this. When you try to predict others' behavior, you often start by asking, well, what have I done? Yeah. Or what would I do? Right. And then you project that onto others. So an extreme taker is like, uh, let's see, what percent of people steal $10 from a company? You know, because takers always talk like that. Um, That's one way to identify yeah, them. Your, your research the doesn't seem that complicated no. to me. No, but these, these takers are like, well, I don't know, last week I stole $344. Like 10 a month is pretty common, 94%. Whereas an extreme giver is like, how, like, how do you even steal $10 from a company? How many pens do you have to take home to add? Yeah. <laughs> it's about 200, by the way, but <laughs> what kind of person would do such a thing? I don't know, 4%. And these differences do play out in large samples. Takers anticipate more selfish behavior from others. And that's part of how they justify and rationalize being a taker. It's not me. I just believe all you people are selfish. So I'm just being smart and cautious to protect myself. So the way you apply this, if you're doing an interview, for example, is think about the taking behavior you are most worried about in your culture. Could be stealing credit for other people's ideas, could be dumping grunt work on others, could be hoarding knowledge instead of sharing it. And you ask candidates, how common do you think those behaviors are? And then if they give their estimate and it's relatively high, you say, why? How did you come up with that? And there are lots of acceptable answers like, oh, I used to work with a lot of thieves, or it used to be my job to catch thieves, and I know the base rate is really high. <laughs> That's okay, right? The, the deadly answer is when somebody says, you know, I just believe that deep down, other people are fundamentally selfish, which is code for I'm fundamentally selfish. Do workplaces need both givers and takers? Nope, no, definitely not. I have no use for takers. I wish they didn't exist. Um, look, I think 
I, I've studied this in terms of a spectrum, right? We have generous givers, we have selfish takers. Most people by default are a third style, which is a matcher, to say, I'll do something for you if you do something for me. And I think that uh, you can get all the benefits of a taker without any of the costs if you have matchers in your workplace. You want a mix of givers and matchers, you want to weed out the takers. And the reason that is helpful is because the, if you keep takers, the givers get paranoid and they become afraid of being helpful and they know that the takers are out to get them. Uh, and so you just kill your, your culture of collaboration. You get rid of the takers, then you have the givers acting generously because there's no reason to fear it. And the beauty of matchers is they believe in justice and fairness. Yeah. And so they are kind to the givers, right? Following the rule of reciprocity, but they are really they, they tough on the takers. They want to punish the takers. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, they're like, it's my mission in life to make sure that every yeah. taker suffers. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, so we're, we're down to about 10 minutes here um, for the program. So I think we should open it up for questions. I know we have a way to take questions on the web. There'll be a slide that comes up to allow us to do that. And we'll also be able to take questions here in the room. So let's get started on questions. Hands up. Hi. Um, so one of my questions, sometimes when I come to these events, um, different kinds of events talking about like women in the workplace, I'm always kind of reminded of Kimberly Crenshaw's work with intersectionality. Sometimes we talk about like women in the workplace and then, you know, or race in the workplace or ability in the workplace. But for some of us, it's an and. So I'm really yeah. curious about what your thoughts about are like the nuances for intersectionality, specifically about like being a black woman in the workplace is different than being a white woman in the workplace. Yeah. And sometimes I don't have advocates at all in the rooms that I'm in. So if, uh, if I were worried about psychological standing, I have even less of it on this topic than the entire gender conversation. Um, I, have, I have tried to become more informed um, by learning from my collaborators and mentees who have had experience as black women. Uh, I've read a lot of the research on this to try to figure out what do we know? And I think we know two things clearly. One is that pretty much every gender bias that's been documented organizationally is amplified uh, when you add in racial diversity. Um, so black women are, um, are punished even more for aggressive behavior or for assertive behavior, which gets perceived as aggressive uh, than white women are. We know that um, the, the office housework that black women do is often taken for granted even more than the office housework of white women. And so I think it is that much harder. And there also isn't the same benefit of strength in numbers, right? Most workplaces are doing relatively okay on at least having critical mass of women, right? And not just having men. But when you add in intersectionality, I think we are a far cry from that uh, in many, many organizations. And so I think that's really hard. I think the, maybe the one piece of hopeful evidence I've seen comes from some research that Ashley Rosette and Robert Livingston did, where they found that in some very specific situations, uh, black women actually ended up with more flexibility uh, for how to, uh, how to run a room or how to manage a team. Uh, and apparently the reason for that is it applies in situations where the stereotypes of women and the stereotypes of African-Americans conflict. And so people don't know which stereotype to apply. And that allows in very, very specific situations, black women to say, okay, I can either, you know, act in ways that are consistent with a black stereotype or consistent in ways that are, uh, or in ways that are consistent with a female stereotype. Um, and I think it would be really in interesting to understand how we can expand that. I think the obvious answer to this question is to say, we've got to get past stereotypes. And I think one of the things that holds us back from doing that is we often don't talk about these differences. I have a colleague at Wharton, Rachel Arnett, who's studied this in really interesting ways. And she shows that if you come from an underrepresented background, uh, when you have the opportunity to engage in cultural self-disclosure, where you say, here's what it was like to grow up as a black woman, for example, most black women pass on that opportunity because they say, I don't want to stand out. I want to fit in. And I want to look for commonalities, not differences. And yet she finds if you have that conversation and you share what your upbringing is like, it actually brings you closer together. Yeah. And it leads the majority group to be more inclusive. And the reason for that seems to be that if you don't share anything about your unique, your unique background, you do get perceived in stereotypical terms as a member of your group. The moment you tell a story about what it was like to, uh, to grow up in your life or how you entered the workforce, that's the moment when you differentiate yourself from the group and you now get processed as an individual, idiosyncratic, unique human being. And so I think for me, maybe one solution that, that's relevant to all kinds of intersectionality is to say, we've got to make cultural self-disclosure a norm, right? To say, when you come into a workplace with someone, when you start to collaborate with someone, the first thing you want to learn is what was it like to be them? And where did they come from? So that you can start to see them as a human being. 
Thank you. Next question. We have a question from Slido. Uh, to what extent do you advocate overcompensating by actively promoting a suppressed class versus purely advocating equality? In other words, what are your thoughts on affirmative action? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have a lot of thoughts on the topic. What's the next question? <laughs> no, I, um, I think it's complicated. I think, again, I feel like my job is to read the research and try to figure out what does it tell us about what's effective and what's just. And I think very frankly, the jury is still out. I think that I am a strong advocate for affirmative action when it comes to university admissions. Um, I think that we have a lot of disadvantage to undo. And I think when it comes to, uh, to creating equality of opportunity and representation, uh, sometimes affirmative action is a necessary step in that direction. Moreover, when I think about the purpose of a university, right, we're supposed to, to expose people in, you know, in a higher, educa uh, excuse me, higher education context um, to new experiences, to new backgrounds, to new ways of thinking. And they're actually much more likely to get access to that uh, if they get to interact with people who didn't grow up the same way that they did. Um, and so for me, that, that case is, is empirically one that can be made. I think in the workforce, it, it gets more complicated, right? Especially if you're running a public company and you have a fiduciary responsibility to, uh, you know, to deliver results for your shareholders. Um, you might have stakeholder groups that, uh, that have particular interests. Uh, I think it becomes really dicey then to say, okay, I'm going to pass over someone who is more qualified in order to make sure that a group that's been historically disadvantaged gets an opportunity. Um, I think, the, I think that this is kind of a false dichotomy though. And I think that instead of saying we should adopt affirmative action in the workplace, we should say, let's make sure we attract awesome applicants from every background so that this is no longer an issue. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm pretty fond of Kieran Snyder's work on this at Textio. Uh, those of you who aren't familiar with it, one of the things she does is she has machine learning algorithms that evaluate a job description. And then they assess it for bias uh, against women, um, against racial minorities. And so shockingly, it turns out, for example, if you write a software engineer job description and it says you're looking for ninjas and rock stars, like strangely, women are not interested in being a ninja or a rock star. Uh, and so then you get to rewrite that job description. You attract more star women and then you don't have to worry about, well, do I take the less qualified woman over the more qualified man? You attract a more qualified woman and then you can hire the person who deserves the job. And I think we need to think about that as a less zero sum game. Other questions? Can we have Mike at the front, please? Or oh, there we go. Hi, I'm a huge fan, by the way. Um, Thank you. Only givers say that. <laughs> I, I think she was talking to me. <laughs> Touche. So I've been in HR for 33 years. I'm old hat. And I also teach for Rutgers uh, Office of Continuing Professional Education. And I go to organizations and teach supervisors. And here's what I've noticed, and, I, and I'm curious about. So generally, generationally, when I'm in a room of supervisors with men, women, and millennial, me, millennials, millennial men particularly, the millennial men are, I don't, I'm not doing that. I don't know why people can't just show up and do their job. And the women are much more open to say, okay, you know, some of this employee engagement stuff is really cool. Mm. A lot of the millennial men say, I've done that and it works. <laughs> so I'm curious if you've seen some of that kind of generational mm. pull for, for this stuff and, and it's changing some of the bi male management bias. A little bit. I, I think that is a little encouraging. Uh, Elisa, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this. Um, where I've seen it the most actually is in the classroom, where you know I've gotten 21-year-olds in my undergrad class every year for the past now 15 years. And I also have MBA students who are typically 26 to 28 every year for that same period. And I've noticed two things. One, um, undergrads in particular are much more enlightened, um, or they would say more woke. Uh, than, <laughs> than, uh, than they were 10 years ago, right? Uh, 10 years ago, I didn't hear anyone talk about gender diversity or racial diversity in the workforce or in the classroom. And it happens all the time now. And my students bring it up even before I have a class session pretty early on it. And I can't even get there before it's been brought up as a topic, right? So I think that's encouraging. I think the other thing though that's interesting and I don't know what's driving this is I find that my MBA students who are male are more defensive 
uh, and less receptive to gender equality than my undergrads are. And I don't know whether they've had some bad experiences where they feel like they are facing reverse, reverse discrimination after a few years in their careers. I don't know whether that is just because they're a little bit older and they're not fully part of the, the younger, more enlightened millennial generation. I think we need to understand one, whether that's really true and whether the anecdotes I'm seeing are, are accurate. And then two, if so, what's causing it and, and how we can continue to improve it. Elisa, what have you seen? Yeah, I, haven't, I don't have any comments specifically of the men versus the women because it'd be so amazingly subjective. Um, but I can tell you, at, at namely specifically, it was so clear to me that the millennial generation had so much enlightenment to offer management and most of our executive management are not millennials. And so we created a reverse mentor program where our millennials are our executive coaches at the company. And whether you're a man or a woman, that has been so enlightening to our team because we get such a different view of what's going on in the workplace, what the thinking is, what the feedback is, and it's just been an amazing program inside the company. So we have time for probably two more questions and then we're gonna wrap it up. So let's take one um, up here up front, we have someone who's been wanting to have the mic. So could we have a mic taken to the front, please? Roshi, and then one more from the web. <laughs> one more from the web. Hi, I'm Roshni, and I work on the recruiting team at Data Miner. So my question is that we do have a group um, where we have members from different teams talking and implementing ideas for diversity and inclusion. So our question, so what we are really thinking about is how do we implement behaviors, you know? Um, so can we have a, I don't know if this is possible, but a goal for the month, this is the behavior that we wanna talk about and implement. And most importantly, how do we track about how we are doing it? Yeah, interesting. What do you think? You want me to go for this one, huh? You start, I have a few thoughts, I wanna so, hear yours. So um, one of the things that we do, if this is helpful, is that we have a pretty clear view of what our values are at the company. And we're working specifically on what are the behaviors associated with each of those values? Because we may have a different interpretation of what that value means. And getting that conversation down literally to the do's and the don'ts. And we haven't finished this work. We've met, we just started on this journey. We have our values really clearly laid out, but the interpretation of the behaviors is something that we've just started. And even at the beginning stages, I can tell you, we just had a meeting this week on it. The do's and the don'ts clarity of what we don't want to see and what we do want to see helps everyone understand what are the norms that we appreciate in the workplace and what doesn't have a place here. I like it. So I guess two thoughts from me. The first one is uh, I think that behavior doesn't exist in a vacuum. And I think we really need to make sure that we address structural issues along with behavioral ones. So the, the source that I would go to on this is Frank Dobbin and Alexander Kalev. Uh, they wrote a, an HBR article in 2016 uh, where they reviewed the evidence on all the different diversity practices that companies have adopted and which ones work. Uh, and they find that, um, one, for example, mandatory bias training backfires and it reduces the representation of women and minorities in management ranks wow. um, because of backlash often. Um, one of the most effective steps, uh, and they can't prove causation here, uh, but one thing that, that seems to be at least a correlate of progress is to have a chief diversity officer, uh, which both makes sure that there's somebody who has a voice to the CEO, that these issues are important, uh, but also signals to the rest of the organization, look, there's somebody in power here that you can come to if you see issues that need to be addressed. And so I think we need to see that happen. Um, in terms of actual behaviors, I think the best bias training I've seen is Patty Devine's. Uh, she's at the University of Wisconsin, and uh, she's done some great experiments where she shows how to overcome defensiveness uh, when you do bias training. And one of the more clever things she does is she actually asks, especially the white men in the room, to, uh, to think about times when they have been the targets of stereotypes and prejudice. And that's a great way to elicit empathy. I, um, I went through a version of this, and I came out of it saying, huh, this is really interesting. Uh, until we talked about it, I didn't realize people stereotyped me as somebody who came from privilege. Because I know I grew up and had to pay my own way through college. And so I kind of always see myself as a non-privileged person. And, but people see me as a professor at an Ivy League school. And that is so unfair. And then I'm like, huh, wow, there are people who deal with much worse versions of that <laughs> every day of their lives than I've faced in the so to total sum of my life. And so... Um, I think that that's probably a practice I'd like to see spread more often. Jason, do you have one quick question? We do. Uh, so this is Brian from online. 
when you generalize the challenges we've discussed for women in the workplace to other underrepresented groups, i.e. ethnic minorities, or should different approaches be emphasized? Yeah, so I think that picks up on the intersectionality yeah. question a little bit. I will say that there, uh, there is a group that, uh, that I think is more neglected than any other when it comes to diversity, and that is disability. Um, uh, there was, uh, there was a, kind of a chilling study showing that 93% uh, of, uh, of global big public companies have a diversity program, and only 7% include disability issues within that. Uh, and I, I think that's, I mean, you should be ashamed of that, right? If you're running a company and you've not thought about disability issues. And, you know, of course, there are the visible disabilities that people face, but so many of them are invisible. Um, you know, do you, do you want to admit to someone that you have a slight hearing problem? knowing that that could disadvantage your performance? Uh, do you want to admit to someone that you're dyslexic, uh, knowing that maybe people might not trust you when it comes to reviewing documents? And so um, there's evidence that uh, roughly 7% of CEOs have a disability and, uh, and only about, I think it was roughly 12 or 13% of them have disclosed those. Uh, and so I think that this has got to start at the top, right? By the time you have risen to a leadership position, if you're not comfortable saying, hey, here's my disability and I'm able to succeed sometimes in spite of it, sometimes because of it, um, your organization has some big problems. And I think we have a ton of work to do in that area too. Well, you think of, the, you think of that happening and disclosing that, it creates such openness in the organization of, oh, okay, it's okay for me to say, yeah. and now I'm more accepted, now I'm more connected, yes. all of the stuff that we talked about. Um, I want to thank our customers. I want to thank um, all of our guests in San Francisco, in Atlanta, here in New York, everyone on the webcast. And of course, mostly thank you so much to Adam for being our guest tonight and being part of the Namely community. Thank you. So this this concludes our program. Goodbye to the folks on the webcast in New York. I hope you'll join us for a little bit of mingling and food and cocktails. And if I could please have the women in group from Namely come on up to the front um, and say uh, hello and then a goodbye to Adam. And we'll also get our picture taken. So thanks so much, everybody. Thank you all. I'll make this quick. I hope you guys enjoyed that as much as I did. He's the